Sorry, Fred. Yeah, it was like it was like the granddaddy of all those physics based. Try to move your guy with physics. Awkward games. movement simulator. Yeah, I mean it even predates uh Game Beasts. All right, I guess we might as well go ahead and get started. Uh, a few things to talk about this week. Uh, biggest one is that we have hopefully the final build of Featurettes Viewer. That's the one that includes uh, some high priority graphics bug fixes, plus mirrors and PBR terrain and support for 2K textures. So uh, it's a big one, and uh, we've been trying to get it out because some of the fixes are uh, dependencies for their viewers. These things like Firestorm is especially concerned about. Um, so that is, as I say, hopefully in its final RC release right now. And if all goes well, we'll be promoting that to the default viewer early next week, possibly Monday. Um, so uh, if that all goes well, then uh, you know, if uh, anybody's waiting on those fixes, please have at it, merge away. We will be doing the same, uh, getting those changes pulled into our other viewers and uh, getting them updated. Uh, let's see, one of the big things that will be happening after featurettes is uh, WebRTC Voice. This is a change that uh, uh, moves us from uh, Vivox to, uh, to our own voice service. Um, and that will be, first step of that is getting support in the viewer. So, uh, you know, if you have a viewer that supports WebRTC, then it's happy working in either kind of a region. You can have regions that are Vivox, you can have regions that are, uh, that are WebRTC, and everything should just work. Um, if you're trying to talk like across region boundaries or in mixed groups, that's where it gets a little more awkward. Um, so anyway, the the uh, WebRTC should be getting its first RC release soon, basically after it gets merged with uh, with featurettes, um, and probably will be one of the one of the sooner ones that will want to get promoted, uh, since that's one of the requirements for getting the voice service transitioned over. Um, the the final throwing the switch there is going to be simulator side. Uh, you have to have the server release that supports it, and you have to have the setting to enable it. Um, so exact date for that is PBD, but getting the viewer out is uh, is the next big step there. Uh, let's see, other things going on. Uh, we have, once Featurettes goes out, one thing we're going to be looking at is our branch management policy. Uh, for a long time, we've had separate viewers kind of living in their own world and merges only happen when viewers get promoted. Um, that has some benefits in terms of protecting us from uh, squirrely bugs getting into all our viewers, but it also has a lot of drawbacks, especially making it much slower to get changes out. Um, and uh, so we're going to a new system where work basically goes into a single sort of ongoing development branch for the most part. Should make things easier for folks who want to contribute changes to the viewer and should get changes out faster. And as for the squirrely bugs, we will see. We're going to have to uh, find other ways of trying to protect ourselves from those. So uh, we'll keep you up to date on that as things change. Uh, another change that I'm not sure if we had mentioned before in this meeting is uh, as you know, we moved away from Jira a while back. Uh, one of the things that we used to do in Jira was to manage uh, PPV requests if people wanted to put in a, a you know, file a, a request for a new viewer or uh, file a complaint about an existing viewer. That all went through Jira. We have a new process for that. It is going through uh, GitHub issues instead, and there is a uh, there is a there is a repo for that. I'll paste it here. Um, yep, and Whirly beat me to it. I shouldn't be shocked. Uh, so if anybody wants to uh, check that out or needs to file a complaint request or whatever, um, then uh, yeah, reach reach out to us there. 
Uh, and I think those are the main announcements. I will uh, hand it over to, uh, let's see, Dave's here, right? I'll hand it over to Dave to talk about uh, what's going on in GLTF land. Sure. Uh, rapid prototyping is going on. Um, you can follow along in content features for GitHub. Um, but there are, there's a test channel up on um, Aditi, uh, what was the post material speech rep package channel on um, Aditi has now been switched to the uh, GLTF dev uh, server branch. Um, and GLTF uploads are enabled there. So if you use the uh, GLTF dev viewer and you connect to one of those regions, then there's some buttons and um, develop GLTF where you can open and upload um, GLTF scenes. Um, there's no simulator representation of them yet, but it does preserve which one is associated with which prem. Um, and the viewer will download them. So you can start mocking up fun little test scenes. Um, and that's sort of becoming the general development branch. Um, so if you make PRs, that would be a safe branch to target uh, as a project slash GLTF development. Um, I'll type it out to spell it. Uh, and um, what else is going on there? Uh, Gaines, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, large file hand handling. Um, Pushed that to uh, Pepper. Pepper's looking at it. Um, we're not sure if it's the viewer closing the connection or the simulator closing the connection, but we'll have to figure out a way to support larger uploads. But yeah, the idea is that you, you'll be able to upload like that entire oil, oil rig that who is trying to do that? AI Austin? Um, or Alasponza, yeah. Although I am curious as to how you got Vertex Buffer Overflow. <laughs> that should have worked. I mean, as long as it was less than, like, 4 billion vertices, it should work. Uh, don't, moment, don't challenge people. You know somebody's going to do 4 billion vertices. Uh, and, and yeah, at the moment, it's not breaking them up very much. It just breaks up the images and generates one binary file and one GLTF file. Um, but as we uh, get into it more and get into optimizing the streaming, well, you can expect them to start getting broken up into multiple bin files, especially when we get into LOD. And I could talk ad nauseum about that, but we might want to address Worley's question. Uh, about sneaking in the fix for the alpha mode. Mm, you know, the only way anything would get snuck in would be if we get, uh, if QA fails uh, this one for uh, for, for promotion. Um, but if, uh, if that comes up, I guess we can take a look at it. Anybody have an opinion about the poll? It looks relatively contained and low risk for what that's worth. But... I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think 
think maint A... So GLTF dev is tracking maint A. As soon as he goes into maint A, he can go into GLTF dev. Um, we've got WebRTC after that. Um, it seems like we should have a release branch off of GLTF dev as soon as Featurettes goes out, but... You know, just for, for QA. So that might be a way to get it out sooner than later. I don't know. Be a good thing to talk about on Monday in our kick off the week meeting. Yep. There'll be a lot of viewer discussions on Monday. And yeah, I'm running a local build of that branch right now, and it's running pretty good. Uh, as far as limits go, um, the spec does define some shoulds uh, and some musts, and the shoulds um, are what we're uh, trying to hit. So the musts you have to hit and the shoulds are optional, and on the shoulds it's things like, uh, like UVs, it says client implementation should support uh, up to two, oh, sorry, should support at least two. Um, so that's the language you're going for for what a reasonable limit is. So two texture coordinates. Um, and it actually does not require that you support two. Um, you may support just one, but um, should support at least two. Uh, as far as unlimited faces go, um, it won't be divided into the eight-face limit because it's not being backed by primitives anymore. Um, uh, and they're they're separate. It's completely separate data. So with uh, like like with Collada Mesh, um, there's still an underlying prem and the uh, Collada Mesh just replaces the geometry. With GLTF, it replaces the entire object. There's no there's no more object. I mean, presumably we will be enforcing some kind of limits, or at least things will impact, uh, you know, land impact and rendering costs in various ways. Yes, at some point the land impact will get so high that you can't res it. But in theory, we'll see how this works out in practice, but in theory you should be able to have like a single GLTF object that eats your entire region's worth of land impact. Uh, avatar limits are almost certainly going to be a thing. Um, this is something we'll have to sort out uh, once we get things close to feature complete and can profile it. Um, they are wearable. Um, it would be pretty silly to do something like this and not let people use it to make clothes. Uh, but yeah, when we, when we get closer to a more complete implementation, we'll, we'll do some, get some hard numbers on, on where uh, things uh, bottleneck and figure out what a, real, a realistic land impact equation is for, for this data model, because it's it's different, so I'll have to come up with a new one. Yeah, there are many, many open questions about how these uh, critters fit into the existing uh, Second Life ecosystem. Be figuring it out as, kind of as we go. Yeah, at the moment, the the next milestone 
um, we'll be having a protocol for keeping things in sync. And then the simulator will start having some knowledge of what's actually inside the GLTFC, namely like the node positions. And, and that's when we'll figure out the LSL API for moving nodes around. Um, once that's there, we'll, we'll, we'll have the framework that we need to start doing some measurements on what the actual load is on the simulator. Um, but we won't know for sure until we've got uh, animation, um, a full LSL API for modifying like material parameters, nodes, and uh, controlling animations. Um, and uh, and physics. Once we have all that, then then we'll be able to figure out the land impact equation. But for now, everything's one land impact on on beta. So break it. Uh, hopefully we have some ways to discourage the enormous numbers of invisible objects hack. Obviously that's been something that people have uh, found ways to do for a long time. I assume if we have the relevant equation sorted out, we can probably get some help on the plug-in side. Yeah, the workflow that I'm trying to focus on First, is you have Blender and Second Life open at the same time, and you're doing a live preview in Second Life. Um, so in that live preview, presumably you'd be able to see what the land impact is before you attempt to upload. That would be awesome, because that would go a long way towards bringing back collaborative editing. Um, but that would really require um, some kind of system where the server acts like a dumb relay and doesn't actually store anything, or peer-to-peer. -peer. And I don't think anybody's comfortable with peer-to-peer. And open up a service where the simulator acts as a dumb relay has uh, got the same kind of problems. And yeah, we're we're looking at the WebRTC data channels for streaming the the GLTF documents. Kicking the data grid. Ah, okay. We have a link there. Uh, yeah, I think a, we are trying to improve the process to make that more self-serve, but we're not quite all there yet. Yeah, it's not peer-to-peer -peer if it's uh, 
relaying through the simulator. But, that, but that's the kind of thing it would have to be in order to enable that kind of collaborative editing without an upload. So yeah, it's uh, definitely something that's on people's minds, but not a prereq for the shipping the MVP. Uh, the transition is going to be different. That's something I wanted to talk to, to folks about and make sure everybody is aware of it as soon as possible. Uh, the transition is going to look a lot more like when we added mesh support than when we added GLTF material support, um, meaning uh, viewers that don't support GLTF scenes won't have a graceful fallback at all. Uh, what, what you'll likely end up seeing on older viewers is something that looks like a, a little chiclet of a sculpt. So just like how when we added mesh support, people who didn't have mesh support in their viewer, they'd see what the underlying prim was. That's what you'll end up seeing without GLTF support, and there's really no way to make that graceful. But the good news is we're shipping the code that does the prototype rendering um, and the next viewer that comes off of GLTF dev. Um, so if you're tracking release, uh, you'll have something that will render the contents of the GLTF scene. Um, but you won't have the latest. So yeah, we're prioritizing having correct display so that can be out as soon as possible uh, so that can percolate to all the other viewers uh, yes you can compress the mesh before upload um, we'll probably be using the mesh opt compression uh, extension and on top of that, we'll be using C standard compression. Um, right now, there's no compression, just to aid in debugging. Hundred KB. That's rough. Yep. Oof. Huh. Suburbs where? Um, the suburbs of Austin. I've got gigabit. I hear, there's a, I hear there's a tycoon with questionable taste in memes who has a fleet of satellites that might be able to help with that. I don't know. 
Oh no. Apparently he lives down the street. Want me to go ask him? Borrow a cup of bandwidth. That actually is a really cool tech. I don't think it'd be a waste of time to make sure that Second Life runs with it. Yeah, I don't know how much uptake they have at this point, but it's a it's a very interesting option. Like yeah, a way Kentucky to nudge some of the lazy service providers. Kentucky has some very challenging geography. Even for Wi Fi. Got a mirror's question here. Um, so, how that works is uh, we do have a collision calling viewer side um, for the mirrors, um, and sometimes that's wrong. Um, but uh, we also go through and put a distance check as well, so anything past a certain point will not render into a mirror, so you may also be running into that. Um, if you see anything super egregious that is not fixable through one of the debug settings, uh, please feel free to file a bug on that. Yeah, there's still some object object conclusion bugs lurking, I think. Grumpity hit one. Um, that I thought was fixed in featurettes, but if people are still hitting it in featurettes, please send me a repro. I'm like 99% sure for, well, for a little bit there in featurettes, we were doing occlusion calling on all probes, not just uh, mirror probes. Um, and that was causing some weird behavior, but we shouldn't be any more at this point. It should just be distance based. So, yeah, there, there is another thing that happens where uh, the viewer will unload objects from memory if they're not in your main view frustum. Um, it's part of the VO cache implementation. Um, I just killed that. Uh, uh, this morning, and it makes the viewer run a lot better because it's not constantly unloading and reloading things. Um, so uh, that I think also helps with the things not showing up in mirrors behind you. Yeah. Uh, also, for for that particular thing, it shouldn't really be a thing, anyways. We, we again, we don't really do a occlusion calling on uh, mirrors. It's just all a distance check. So. Yeah, and what this what this check was doing was basically saying if it hadn't been visible in the main camera for more than like 60 frames, it was eligible to just get derezzed. Mm. Which is what causes that whole situation where you're facing one direction and then you turn around and the world like reloads and then you turn back around and the world like reloads again. So killed that check. I, I think it was there in the name of reducing memory footprint, but that's not how you reduce memory footprint and you reduce memory footprint by aggressively unloading textures, which we do now. Um, so I don't think that's relevant anymore. And starting to give the rest of the VO cache stuff there the, the stink eye because it also doubles the amount of occlusion calling and frustum calling we have to do. That is that one is not in feature edge. That's in will be in GLTF dev probably early next week. At some point, yes. Uh, for the MVP of uh, mirrors, no. Yeah, Once you take um, another look at it, right now it's confusing, but yeah. Yeah, I think what we need UX-wise there, and this has been floated around internally a bunch, just more or less waiting for a 
somebody to say yes go do that um is uh uh having a spawn mirror button where you click that button and then you click on the thing that you want to be the mirror and it creates a mirror probe that's lined up encompassing the object that you clicked on and aligned with the triangle that you clicked on and that would make it so you don't even have to deal with manually rotating it Yeah, if somebody who's not me wants to write that up and put it into Canny, that might help. <laughs> I believe we do have an asset floating around somewhere that is just a pre-made mirror. Yep. I don't know that that made it into the library yet or not, though. Yeah, if we got stuff for the library, we probably need to get an issue for that. I don't think it's in yet. Yeah, I think I know who to follow up with. Anyway, if it isn't obvious, I think we're kind of in the general Q&A phase here. If people have questions that aren't GLTF related, that's fine too. Uh, GLTF animations on SL Skeleton. Um, I think so, but I won't say absolutely 100% yes until uh, that bridge is built. But I don't see any reason why that won't be possible. Um, uh, big asterisk there, like like arbitrary animation on arbitrary skeleton is an unsolved problem generally, but you should be able to make animations against the the uh, the second life skeleton in the GLTF format. Yeah, just keep in mind that um, the uh, content for SL twenty one B is all PBR. And doesn't have any blend fawn fallbacks. And what's the schedule for that? Uh, constraints are going to be interesting. Uh, that's going to be an intersection of um, the uh, GLTF animation spec and an incoming extension for rigid body setups. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know anything about the BBH importer. Uh, that might be a question for who? I know a bit about the BBH importer. What's the question? Does it reject anything with constraints, or does it just reject some constraints that it should accept? Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure that's something that we had a Jira for that's gotten lost in the shuffle with the move to GitHub. Um, but I will see if I can dig it up. I'll just make a note in our meeting doc here. Yeah, we've got a new guy on the sim side that we're piling all the validator and uh, lend a dollar fee for upload stuff onto. So. <laughs> Say hi to Pepper when you see them and ask them for their linden bear. It sounds like there's also some IK related stuff as well in that ask. Yeah, the constraints the current constraint system is as far as I can tell completely undocumented, but there are some existing you know, old animations that use it and so you can have like a constraint that'll will cause you to hands to rest in your lap when you're sitting, you know, cross legged or whatever. So, you know, it's it's useful for some things and there is a sort of an IK aspect to it. Um, but uh, as, as I say, I, I can't find any docs on it. I, I don't know how many people over the course of Second Life's long and illustrious history have actually created animations with constraints in them. But it is something that we, you know, technically support, and we probably shouldn't be rejecting them in the in the server. Well, uh, thanks, Trace. I'll take a look at that. Uh, I think I wrote this, but um, it ha does have some, some notes on constraints from Jenna, so that's good. PR would probably be made against a main. But if you make it against main, we have to rebase it um, to some other release vehicle because code doesn't go to main until after it goes through QA and gets released. Um, so 
the uh, project slash GLTF development branch as a safe target. Um, or you could try finding um, finding out which mate to target. Yeah, I'd say GLTF development is reasonable. We're going to be going to uh, to a model where most things go to development branch soon anyway. Yeah, and, and hopefully when, once we do that, um, you'll see a develop branch, um, and that'll be the default branch. So when you make a PR, it'll just target that branch automatically. If that works, then the way the release flow will look like is we'll, we'll ship a viewer and then we'll fork develop uh, to get stabilized and shipped. Um, and then we'll just keep repeating that instead of having multiple parallel mates. That should reduce the merge burden internally, substantially, and hopefully externally as well. But it does run the risk of log jamming things if develop gets hopelessly broken or unshippable. It kind of spreads out the merge burden. You're kind of dealing with merges all along rather than in kind of one big batch after a promotion. Yeah. Yeah, the idea is that you've got a release branch that's your release candidate and it's being QA'd and you're only fixing showstoppers and that and that branch. Um, but anytime you make a change to that branch, it ships back to develop. But develop doesn't go to that branch. Um, and then once that ships, then you make a new one off of develop, repeat forever. And yes, we're definitely trying to be better about accepting pull requests um, and reducing deltas between third-party viewers and the second life slash viewer repository uh, because it sucks for everybody when somebody works hard on something and then we don't have the code and we break it. Sometimes we do have the code and we still break it. Yeah. We probably need a way to uh, have a. How to put it? Probably need a way to enable people to submit test plans with their PRs that live longer than the PR. We started adding test plans to uh, the viewer repository. Um, I don't think that's totally caught on yet, but that might be the way. If you look in that folder, you'll see some some test plans. Some of them are better than others. Um, but it would definitely be nice when you submit a PR to include a file there that explains how the feature is supposed to work. Yeah, that's a really good point about test plans because that's a very basic requirement of any new feature work that we do internally. If if there's no if there's no spec and there's no test plan, then it's uh, it's not clear, you know, what is this thing and how do we know if it's right? Yep. Oh, and an automated viewer testing framework is under active development now. <laughs> Did you want to talk about that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we we mentioned before that we're looking into uh, client side scripting uh, using using uh, Lua. It's actually the Luau uh, framework. Um, so that's going to have a, a, I think a range of interesting applications. It's going to come out as a uh, kind of set of different release stages, uh, kind of phases. So uh, it will support more things over time, but uh, being able to automate standard behaviors and, and make sure that uh, things work as, as intended is uh, definitely one of the ways that it would be possible to use it. Yeah, and that's kind of where I hope that test plans folder is going is it just becomes a set of markdown files of like community contributed uh, test plans and scripts. Um, so you broke my feature. Here's a script that will test it so you never break it again. Awesome. Isn't everything in inventory already called object? Yeah, well, that's an excellent point. We, we know one of the things that we're looking at for the Lua stuff is, uh, you know, what what do you want to expose and what don't you want to expose? Um, things that make it easy to destroy your inventory or the category of things we don't really want to expose. You know, even if there would be nice uses for them too, that's probably not going to happen. Just stepped away and I tripped over a MacBook on the way back. Uh, question about Linux viewer and Apple Silicon viewer. Brad and I were just talking about Apple Silicon today. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Eventually, it's likely we'll have uh, we'll have Apple Silicon. There's there's already a contribution working its way through the system for. Linux support, um, so at some point that will be out and, uh, you know, supported about as much as we supported Linux before, which is to say that it's, you know, it's mostly community driven, but we, we will, um, you know, have viewers built for Linux as part of our, uh, as part of our deploy process and, you know, you'll be able to download them and all of that. And I think Brad was saying that one of the main gates to uh, Apple Silicon support is the third-party library. Yeah. Ecosystem. Yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, so I've, I've started touching a couple of the third-party libs to, to get their, them built as uh, universal libraries, both with Intel and, uh, and Apple Silicon um, versions of all the objects in the library. Um, it's a 
not a full-time project for me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, it's whenever I'm touching a library and I can figure out that particular library's build system for how to configure the, the architecture, uh, then I do it uh, and it goes in. Um, I think having the Git flow as a destination for those types of sort of little maintenance changes to libraries is, is going to be actually helpful <laughs> uh, for this um, so that things can go in gradually. Uh, and not sort of get stalled. Um, so yeah, there's probably about three or four libraries that I've done this for so far, and uh, and more to come. And we we definitely don't have a time frame for that one. It's you know yeah we we have the desire to have the support, but uh, it could turn out to be uh, just way too complicated. And we just say hey, you know, if somebody sends us a contribution, we're interested. Um, uh, we could say, uh, you know, check back next year. We'll uh, to be determined. Yep. And on that note, we we can and do accept uh, PRs to three uh, uh, P dash repositories. Um, yeah, so... and that's how almost all the work for the Linux build that's in main B right now. Like almost all that came in from contributions to the third party libs. So if we want to make it a community effort. Um, that's absolutely something we can do. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you want to submit a you know set of contributions to bring back Solera support or something, um, you know. Yes. I guess you could. <laughs> I do OS. But yeah, ARM is definitely not going anywhere, and it looks like x86 might be. So. It's a question of when, not if. But yeah, and in fact, like if, if you've gone through the effort to update a third party library um, for something that you're doing on your viewer, and you find yourself like self-hosting the package. It would be great if you just submit a PR and then we'll host the package and then we'll be able to have that work done already to update the library for uh, the Second Life viewer as well. Yeah, yeah, we should definitely pool as much resources for that kind of infrastructure as we can. Yeah, uh, Rai has been pretty good about that because Rai has like a, on, on the Alchemy Viewer, like all the third-party library packages are self-hosted. Um, and I think we're starting to move towards making that a little less true, hopefully. That can't be cheap. Yeah, having to build all our own libraries for everything is a major pain point, um, and it leads to the chaotic to kind of rebuild the universe. We're trying various type of dates. Um, so if we could get to using more prefab components, uh, that would be a, an improvement. May be doing that at some point. Yeah, but but there's a but, but those are actually some good examples of, of how to get your third party library build put onto the Second Life org. Um, if you look at uh, 3P GLM I think is one of the more recent ones. Um, uh, if I can spell. Yeah. Um, 
So that's a fork of Alchemy's 3P GLM. Um, if you look at the, uh, oh, see, the, the license file, not the license.glm file, um, that would be where you'd put your contribution thing um, for doing the 3P packaging. Um, and then uh, you include the license for the actual third-party library separately. So that that's a, that, that one's a good template to look at if you want to see how to contribute a 3P package that works with our build machinery. And I'm pretty sure as soon as you... Yeah, as soon as we get the first commit in, when you make PRs against it, I think our build machinery picks it up and does the continuum integration thing. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah, for all the existing ones that have a .github workflows folder, it's, that should work. For a new contribution, it would be some setup required for that. All right, I guess we are about at time. Uh, thanks for coming by, everybody. Keep an eye out for hopefully featurettes going out soon next week, and we will talk to you later. Everyone. Yeah, thanks, folks.